for coming. My, my name is David Cohn. I'm Executive Director of Public Affairs here at the Union League Club of Chicago. And on behalf of the officers, directors, and members of the club, it's my privilege to welcome you to this afternoon's forum that the club's Public Affairs Committee is presenting in partnership with the Better Government Association. I'm actually up here wearing two hats because in addition to my full-time public affairs job here at the club, I also am privileged to serve on the BGA Board of Directors. So we thank you for being with us for this timely and important conversation. Uh, I wanted to mention briefly the reason that the Union League Club of Chicago and the BGA have a partnership is that you are currently in the only private club in the United States that has an institutional commitment to public policy, advocacy, and community service. Uh, for the last 126 years since our founding, we have been involved in civic affairs in this city and in the state and indeed at the national level. And it's in that context that we are so proud to present this afternoon's conversation about the proposed site of the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. Uh, without further ado, to get our program underway, it's my privilege to introduce uh, the fearless leader of the Better Government Association, the man who's keeping us all honest, government and citizen alike, the president and CEO, Mr. Andy Shaw. Let's hear it. Sir. Would that I kept everybody honest. I have enough trouble just worrying about myself, but uh, there are a lot of folks out there we try to keep an eye on. I'm a president and CEO of the BGA. Some of you know I spent a few years in the news business, and I'm thrilled to see a room full of people interested in an important public policy issue. I think you know, if you've been here before, that the BGA shines a light on government and holds public officials accountable for a very simple reason. Good government is our right, because we give public officials our hard-earned tax dollars. Involuntarily, we don't have a choice. You don't like a Wendy's burger, you go to McDonald's. But if you don't like the way your government operates, you still owe them your taxes. And so watchdog organizations are essential to shine that light and hold them accountable because they have our money and we have absolutely every right in the world to demand that the government they run be honest and efficient and transparent and fair. And that's what we do. We do it in four ways, actually five ways. We investigate, we litigate, we educate, we advocate, and we communicate. Um, I apologize for the rhyme. I spent a lot of years covering Jesse Jackson. <laughs> and I always, get a good, I always get a good laugh out of that, especially in a Chicago audience. But we do those five things, and that makes us a full-service watchdog organization. And this is one of our educational components. We actually have two. We have citizen watchdog training programs, which means we go around the state, fill a room like this, and spend a couple hours actually informing people about the rudiments of watchdog work, what the Open Meetings Act means, what freedom of information entitles you to, what to do when a FOIA request is denied, how to listen to a meeting, listen to a conversation at a public meeting, maybe look at a budget, look at a contract. Most importantly, how to keep your eyes and ears open. This fight for better government is only possible with an army of watchdogs. By ourselves, we are a nice, effective watchdog organization, but we will never move the ball very far because there aren't enough of us and there are too many of them out there at the various branches of government. As you know, Illinois has 7,000 units of government. That's a lot of public officials, most of whom do a good job. They give us a day's work for a day's pay. The problem is the ruling class in government is all too often in it for themselves and not us. And that's why they need the watchdogs, to make sure that they don't think our money is actually their private piggy bank, to be used on them and their friends and their family members and their cronies and their political supporters, which happens all too often. So that's the quick narrative of BGA. There is a, a brochure that explains all of this in, in, in the English language. I think it's fairly clear and concise. The brochures are out there. And the only pitch you're going to get from me before the before the forum begins is the same one you'll have at the end. Um, we are an apolitical, nonpartisan, 501c3, nonprofit organization. We are only as strong as the people who support us. So if you enjoy this forum and you like the work of the BGA and you think it's important to have someone holding those folks accountable, pick up a brochure and consider, consider becoming a member or a contributor to this organization. Um, no amount is too small. Also out there are my business cards, and I tell you that because I answer every email I get with a tip or an idea, a comment, a criticism, they all get answered. 
So if you want to communicate directly with uh, the guy who's at the helm of the organization, uh, get in touch with me. A lot of our staff members are here today, and if you want to chat with them afterwards, that would be great. Uh, I want to say hi quickly to two board members, Howie Alper and Bob Levin from the BGA board joining us, John Sirick from the McCormick Foundation, one of our strongest allies in the philanthropic world, and then a number of assorted other friends and confederates, uh, a couple of my old colleagues from ABC7, Mark and Eric, who I admonished to take only good pictures of me and feature me prominently on the news tonight, <laughs> in deference to my long and uh, allegedly distinguished career at that television station. Anyway, with no further ado, look, this is, nothing could be more timely, and we could not have a better panel tonight. I should say before I introduce the panel and let them each uh, make a couple of uh, minutes of opening statements. Format is simple. They'll each make a few minutes of opening remarks, then I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll take questions from you for the final half hour because at the end of the day, you're the residents and taxpayers. You want to be able to ask the questions you like. I should point out that we do not have a representative here from the Chicago Park District or from the City of Chicago Administration. We invited both to participate, both declined. And so if no one is here from the public sector defending this plan, it's because they chose not to participate, not because we didn't include them. So with no further ado, oh, I, yes, thank you so much. Um, at my advanced age, I forget at least one thing in every presentation, and I want to thank our friends at Can TV who are recording this and actually broadcasting it live at this moment on channel 27. If you want to catch the stream of this broadcast on your computer, which is an odd thing to say to people in the room watching with us, and also to those at home that are watching on TV because they're already covered, but I was asked to do this, so I shall. You go to cantv.org slash live on your computer, and you can actually watch this on your screen. And lastly, if you want information about Can TV programming and activities, they're wonderful folks and they're good friends of ours. You go to cantv.org. Is that okay? Thanks. That's Bob Reed, who is basically he's, he's my he's my alter ego. He makes sure I behave, which is actually a bigger job than his his day job. Okay. No further ado. Our panelists. Panelist number one, right in, in the order they're sitting here, Lee Bay. Lee, uh, by way of resume, is um, he is a member of the mayor's appointed Lucas Museum Task Force which worked on the selection of a proposed site for the museum, former architecture critic at the Chicago Sun-Times, and he is currently Associate Director of Arts and Public Life Initiative, University of Chicago. Lee uttered one of the more revealing quotes um, about the museum when, I think, in the early stages, and he can, he can talk about it more fully or he can retract it, but I told him I was going to read it and he had no objections because Lee, as a journalist, understands that pretty much anything is fair game. What Lee said, and I quote is, to me, it's an urban planning hat trick. Chicago gains a major world-class museum of this size without having to displace people or demolish buildings or lose open space. In fact, we will gain open space. This is a win for the city and its citizens. Now, whether or not he tempered that view in the, in the, in the weeks or months since he uttered it remains to be seen, but that's why he's here to tell us that. Next to Lee is Gail Spreen. She is the president of the Streeterville Organization of Active Residents, better known as SOAR. SOAR hasn't taken a public position on the museum, but they have a strong interest in the community input process, and she can speak about that. And Gail is here, uh, I'd say in large part, to talk about the experience of SOAR, which was instrumental in actually backing off the Daly administration from its plan to put the Children's Museum in Grant Park. And I say that was not an inconsiderable feat when you think that in the city of Chicago, people assume that anything suggested by a mayor is a done deal before he even utters the words. And so to basically undo that ship uh, as it sailed toward Grand Park uh, to its present home on Navy Pier is probably no less of a civic accomplishment than it would have been for the captain of the Titanic to actually turn the ship before it hit the iceberg. <laughs> So nice going. Gail joins us with a pretty good pedigree in uh, sort of taking on the power structure. And I see Chris Swanson, another member of the BGA board. Thanks for joining us, Chris. That means this event is only 59 minutes because Chris only allocates one hour to every BGA activity, right? And last but certainly not least, the person who actually already made, 
a news headline out of this event before it even started, and I'll tell you why in a second, is Cassandra Francis. She is president of Friends of the Park. Friends opposes the museum's placement on the museum, museum campus, claiming the campus site would violate the Lakefront Protection Ordinance. And I would suspect that that has something to do with the fact that tomorrow, Friends of the Park is going to be filing a federal, federal court lawsuit to challenge the site selection. Uh, I think it's the site as opposed to the concept. Right. So Cassandra, of course, will talk more about that. And before we take opening remarks, I just want to say one final thing. The BGA has no position on the Lucas Museum because in most of these cases, our biggest concern is for a, a good process. It's important that it be transparent. It's important that the people who propose these things be held accountable for their plans. And most importantly, we need an open and a slow enough process to allow input from citizens. That's what dialogue is about. And so we come in support of a healthy process, and we assume that that healthy process will lead us to a healthy outcome. Um, I think you can argue the pros and cons of virtually everything, um, and, but, but I think that you cannot argue about the value of the process. And so the last thing I'm going to say is that we begin this with, this has been a field day for the, um, it's been a field day for the media that's been writing about it, and I just want to share a couple of things that, that make, it, make it very clear why this room is filled. If you, if you listen to Blair Kamen, the architecture critic of the Tribune, this is a behemoth. It is a colossus. Neil Steinberg, the columnist for the Sun-Times, called it Space Mountain, borrowing from the Disney attraction. Um, Fran Spielman of the Chicago Sun-Times, uh, what did she call it? She called it a palace for Jabba the Hutt. And not to be outdone, a gentleman named David Evans, who I don't know, uh, I think it's David Evans, I know it's Evans, I may have missed the first name, wrote a very good op-ed in the Tribune, and he said his hope is that this doesn't turn out to be a half-baked, baked Alaska. <laughs> of course, a play on the form of the, uh, of the renderings we've seen. So with, with all that as a run-up, let's, let's listen to the early thoughts of each of our panelists, beginning with Lee Bay. Now, I don't want to go first now, <laughs> right? But, but I will. Uh, the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art, in my view, will be an asset to the city of Chicago and the near south lakefront. It's a unique museum, at least as planned, as unique now as the Adler Planetarium was when it opened in 1931 as the first planetarium in the Western Hemisphere. From ancient cave drawings to digital cinema, everything in between, and an educational and research component as well. Now, I was a member of the 12th member, um, tw the 12 member Lucas Museum Task Force uh, that picked this site. And uh, the group was assembled to find the best place within the city uh, to place the museum. And we didn't do this work in isolation. Uh, or really without competition, because San Francisco, who let it go, wanted it back. Uh, Los Angeles was getting together, and we were hearing r rumors at places like New York and Cleveland that um, everyone wanted a piece of this thing if we didn't get it or if San Francisco didn't get it. And over the course of six weeks, we solicited and got public input on where the museum should go. About 100 people attended an April public meeting uh, about the museum as well. And at that meeting, virtually all, if not all, the people there supported the idea for the museum to come to Chicago, which for us was a good thing. Then as a task force, our next, next job was to then seek an accessible location uh, for this museum to go, for this cultural jewel. So we looked at dozens of sites around the, t around the city. Uh, many of them were given, most of them actually, were given to us by the public. So we looked at places like the old Uptown Theater. We looked at uh, some industrial space on Roosevelt Road, west of Ogden uh, Avenue. Uh, we looked at the Washington Park community, where I work at, during my day job at the University of Chicago, as well as the Washington Park, the actual park. Um, and we looked at the, even the old Michael Reese Hospital site, and I can probably get into that in the Q&A a little bit more. But for the task force, we had to look for a site that was large enough to accommodate a museum of this size, which was like the first cut. And that uh, you know, took a lot of places out of, the, uh, out of the running, plus parking. And that shortened the potential list considerably. We also wanted to be close to public transit. So, and we also wanted to be near other cultural institutions. And we were also trying to keep the, mayor's, uh, the mayor honest about his uh, position that no taxpayer dollars be used to uh, build this museum, so we stayed away from privately owned sites that had to be purchased. 
And those decisions helped lead us to the spot that we're talking about today, the giant parking lot south of Soldier Field, but close to the museum campus. A nationally renowned museum would be far better, in, our, in my view, in our view, uh, the task force's view, and more accessible use for the site other than stadium parking. Leveraged correctly, and that's key, the museum could spark the transit improvements that the museum campus and Soldier Field area have long needed. And with the right design, and we'll talk about that in a minute, <laughs> the new museum could add usable park space to the area rather than take away from it. Now about the design. I've been clear and public uh, about my reservations about Mod Architect's design for the Lucas Museum. I think it's too massive. I think it's too stony for its own good and our own good. Uh, I'm still, frankly, figuring out where, the, where it connects to public transit and where, our, where the new green space will be. Um, and I've got more complaints, and I could take up two hours talking about that. Uh, but what I like about it is, is that it's not a safe, cute, neoclassical design like the one Lucas was requested to do for the Presidio. Uh, so it doesn't have cute columns and pediments and that kind of thing. It's, it's a bold and futuristic museum um, for a bold and futuristic idea. And I like the idea of going bold on the leg front. I think the, leg, I think the location warrants it, and, but also my view, it warrants a new design. Uh, but again, not a new location. That's it. Thanks, Lee. Now it's your turn if you're, and let me just say in uh, Gail's defense that she's battling uh, some, some, some health issues today, and so she's gonna Just give it the today. best shot possible. <laughs> And if I dash out the side, my um, cohort Malik is here and he can take over because we do a lot of urban planning work together. So he's right up front to, to sit in for me. But I'm here to talk about, um, if you're not aware, SOAR is a 40-year-old community organization, represents the residents of Streeterville, and I see some Streetervillians here today. Um, and we, we have a real process as we review projects. So we totally believe in transparency in everybody working together and coming up with the best developments. So anytime that there is, um, we also have, you know, we have a Street of Old Neighborhood Plan that is a document that we've um, worked on a couple times. So we really have put a lot of thought into our planning process. We have planning and zoning principles that will review any kind of projects that come before us for the neighborhood. We'll review those with some basis to them. So. Developers do know what we're looking for and what we would like to see in our neighborhood. So those are, um, so there's some basis there. And so we just um, appreciate the fact of being able to have transparency, have community meetings in any projects that, that are being proposed. And we have had almost every developer, whether it's the institutions or individual developers, will tell us at the end of the project, because of community input, our project is a better project. And so it really takes the people of the city of Chicago, being this being such a, a huge city um, asset that is um, being proposed, to actually support and be behind it and really look at all the issues because we are all there, all here every day and kind of living, uh, living the dream. So um, in addition to a lot of the planning principles that we review projects by, you know, key ones are uh, the transportation and parking, um, traffic, how the circulation will work for pedestrians as well as for vehicles. So that's a very key part of, of a review process that we, would, uh, that we would have on a project like this. Also, the Lakefront Protection Ordinance, we very much respect the Lakefront Protection Ordinance and um, we'd be very concerned as to having anything that would be precedent setting that would be against that. We just you know, believe in the lakefront. It's an asset for everyone. You can't get it back once it's gone, you know, once it's given up. So you really, you know, you need to respect it and protect it. And so um, I thank you for the opportunity, Andy, to be here today just to talk about um, transparency and, per and being able to get community input, which I think is very key. Okay, and the third opening statement comes from Cassandra Francis, who uh, gave all of us a jolt this afternoon when we <laughs> saw a tweet from Blair came into the Tribune announcing that there would be a lawsuit filed tomorrow. Uh, we decided we were thinking we should dump on Cassandra for scooping our event, but we figured it actually added a little bit of uh, news energy to the event, and how could any of us who spent so many years in the news business uh, resent news energy? So take it away, Cassandra. Thank you. Um, again, I'm Cassandra Francis. I have been uh, president of Friends of the Parks for about eight months now. 
And like Andy's um, organization, BGA, we are a watchdog group, but we tend to try to do that in partnership with our prime partners, which are the Park District and the City of Chicago. I will admit that since I have been on board in the short time, there have been a number of challenges to open space, so I have been um, acting in this realm um, more than I had anticipated. However, it's a very important um, part of the process, an important thing, a part of what we do. So our, our organization, which is 40 years old this year, um, its mission is to preserve, protect, improve, and promote the use of parks throughout the Chicago area. Um, the Lucas Museum, first, we always start by saying we are thrilled this facility is coming to Chicago. Um, I personally love uh, Star Wars, and we are absolutely thrilled it's coming here. It is the site that we oppose, and the main basis that we oppose the site on is the Lakefront Protection Ordinance. Um, the Lakefront Protection Ordinance specifically states and precludes any further private development east of Lakeshore Drive. This word private, and whether it's a private facility, is one that we will be talking more about in the coming days. Um, but that really is our basic premise. This, the lakefront is something that has been protected for over a century um, that we are all benefiting from now. In fact, because it has been protected for this period of time is the only reason we have the opportunity to talk about it and to even have someone offer this site up to, um, to shiny objects. So one of the things that we have, <laughs> um, I also want to state that the, the lawsuit, the timing of the lawsuit, it is just coincidentally today um, there was this little thing called the election and another little thing um, that we've been dealing with with Veterans Day yesterday. So we've been working on this lawsuit for a long time. And we have been garnering support both from the public, but also we've been working with a very broad legal team. Um, and we are indeed, and I will confirm this for the press, filing tomorrow. And there will be a press conference uh, tomorrow. So one of the other things I just wanted to discuss a bit is the public comments that we get. These are not necessarily our arguments. Our argument is not on the lakefront and also not in a park if we are successful in looking at other sites. But some of the other issues that have galvanized public opposition to the site um, are the design, which I think that's one thing that was a bit of a um, surprise to a number of people. Not our issue, um, but I've heard a bunch of other um, things, and I will say one of my staff walked into the office one day and said that Mickey called. I said, Mickey who? They said, Mickey Mouse, he wants Space Mountain back. Um, <laughs> it gave me a little laugh during a, so this is something that um, it really has galvanized, first of all, a focus on the project, but also galvanized opposition, I think, also to the project as well as the site. I think this has come up because it really has signaled a very large gesture on a lakefront that many people feel, even if they might not be against a building, should be, have a gesture of respect for the lakefront. Um, again, the design is not our issue. One of the other issues is access. Um, most people who have driven by this uh, during a Bulls, uh, Bears game or other types of activities is, are aware of the gridlock here. This is yet another destination at this location that will cause an issue. Plus, the mayor has put together a task force to look at transportation issues in this area. The transportation issues are going to be paid for by the public. So um, the issue of budget is one that the public does need to be very aware of. This is one of the types of things that um, Andy's organization looks at closely. Um, but relative to the building, it's also very curious, we find, that the 93,000 square foot building that was proposed in San Francisco um, had a budget of an estimated budget of $300 million. Uh, currently, the building that is proposed for Chicago is 400,000 square feet, uh, an increase of four, fourfold, um, plus parking, underground parking, replacing the parking that's existing there that the tailgaters were using, a bridge that Mr. Lucas has agreed to pay for, and the number, the estimated budget that is in the memorandum of agreement with the Chicago Park District and the Lucas Museum of, of um, Narrative Art is indeed that same $300 million. So that is another issue we need to look at closely, the issue of ongoing operating and maintenance um, endowment that has been discussed but has not been identified as far as the cost there. These are all issues we need to, we need to look at. So again, our, our main opposition is relative to the Lake from Protection Ordinance. These other um, issues will come into play as part of this. And uh, thank you for having us here today. And I'm sorry about the, uh, the last minute surprise. No, I was being facetious. It's, it, was good, it was good news. News is good news. So anyway, Cassandra, we're, we'll do the Q&A, and I think location is obviously the biggest issue for the most number of people, we'll, so we'll, we'll get back to that. I want to go through a couple of the other things that are also important. Let me just ask you to say in one sentence what the grounds of the lawsuit are. I know you'll explain in great detail, but you've talked around it. 
tell us what you're essentially saying in the suit. Okay, and, and tomorrow at our press conference, there will be a, a, a attorneys who will be able to describe this in more detail. But the basic premise and the basic doctrine, legal doctrine that we are utilizing here is public trust. And one of the public trust doctrine, this land is held on behalf and for the benefit of the public. Um, so that is the basic premise. The Lakefront Protection Ordinance, while um, is important and may not um, play specifically in the complaint, is the embodiment of the public trust uh, doctrine in Chicago, it's the local expression of that. So that has really been our, our response as far as what our concerns are relative to the site, the public benefit, and, and holding that for um, a public use is something that is really the basis of our legal action. Okay, good, so I have a few questions. I wanna go through the component parts here and then we'll get back to location, which of course is so important. What's the retail saying? Location, location, location. I think in this particular case, that may be the three complaints about this one. But let's take a couple other things first. Um, I'd like each of you to weigh in very briefly on the design. Um, Lee, I think you each touched on it. Now, I tend to be pretty loose when it comes to that. I like things that jar locations. In fact, I'm one of the few people I know that actually like the Thompson Center. I may still be the only one in Chicago. <laughs> and I know, how, I, know how, what, I know how dissonant it was from the surrounding buildings, especially City Hall, because it was this little you know, spaceship next to this iconic government building. But I think that is what enhances the value of a city. And so dissonance is not a bad thing. I think we grow to value differences. But that's just Andy Shaw, the citizen, speaking. Um, at, at the BGA, you know, we're not architecture critics. But let me ask you, I don't think that this design was necessarily the final one. I mean, this gentleman would change it if there was enough concern, wouldn't he, Lee? I would, I would hope so. Uh, and particularly, particularly given the fact there is there is some concern, and you know, and sometimes these things, you know, you never know fully what stage they are in when they are rolled out and how conceptual they, they, they are. Um, but I'm 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 going I'm to assume in this case that there's room for change, particularly if uh, the desire to change it comes from you know a certain important floor in, in City Hall. Although although you know the public has clearly spoken um, loudly and and uh, what they feel, so that could perhaps. Uh, spark the desire to look at this thing. But you're the way. architecture critic on the panel, and former, you actually former, feel, former, right, former, but you actually former. point out <laughs> you, you you may not like all of this design, but but its bold futuristic uh, approach is not what troubles you. It is not. I mean, the idea of going bold on, on the lakefront, I like that idea. I just don't necessarily like the execution of it. I would not. What I would not want to happen is again have a uh, as a solution a kind of a a cutesy, classical-looking museum like the smaller one he did at, at the Presidio, which I think he was sort of forced into that to sort of make it match the surroundings. Um, so I, I, I like the boldness. I just don't like the execution. Okay, and, and each of you take a quick crack at that. Um, I, I would say in Streeterville, anyhow, we support um, great architecture. We are always pushing all our developers to come up with the very best and something unique and, and creative. So to that degree, even though SOAR as an organization has not taken a position on this, I, I do believe we, we, um, we like to see something different and creative. Um, Size-wise is a, is a whole other um, aspect and the location because it is very, feels like it's something that's very huge jammed in a, a, a very small spot. So it's, even though it's something unique that you're seeing, it feels like it's just too jammed in. There's just not enough open space around it to really make it feel like um, you're really getting the full impact of, of a design. Cassandra? Uh, really two points on design, the first of which is one of the original promises was additive green space. And I think the original numbers were the site's 17 acres, the building will be approximately five, that will be a net add of 12, uh, 12 acres of green space. And these are parking lots now, we fully admit that, but they are open space. Once you put a building there, they are forever precluded as open space. The, open, the design actually virtually adds no net add of green space because if you look at the footprint of the parking lot, and we're only talking about the south parking lot because the north parking lot, the structured two-story uh, parking lot Waldron Deck is staying exactly in place. So the south parking lot, if you look at and eyeball that, per, that area with the area of the new design, of the proposed design, it's virtually the same. So no net add of green space. The second thing I would say on design is that I personally am not afraid of iconic design. I just think this design would look much better on a deck above the 31st Street Marshalling Yards. 
And, and I'll tell you, the one email I got that I thought was, was most basic and most interesting was, hey, it's on the lakefront, no windows? I mean, that was just a very practical thing. You're in the museum, wouldn't you think you'd have a window to look out at the beautiful lake? I mean, there's not a building in downtown that doesn't give you a view of the lake, so that's not exactly the dispositive issue, but I did find it amusing. And I, someone described it, my wife had not seen all the renderings, and someone described it to her. They said, you remember that old hostess product called a snowball? You know, that <laughs> white thing filled with chocolate and, anyway. So that's, that's my addition to the, um, to the litany of good names for it. You'll know it's arrived when either John Stewart or Colbert do something about it on their, on their show and then they, and they pull out all these names. Okay, let, let's switch to something really practical and I don't think anyone has the final answer. Cassandra alluded to this. Gail hasn't studied it yet, neither have we. Lee may know a little bit more than some of us, so let me direct this at you. Um, it was my understanding that Mr. Lucas would write the entire check, but Maybe then there's the question of infrastructure, which always seems to get separated out from projects. Is it your understanding that he pays for everything, including a bridge over troubled waters or whatever? <laughs> or would you say that he's only paying for his, his museum and then the rest of the infrastructure is up to the city? And, and, and does that raise the possibility of still another TIF to somebody who arguably is not <laughs> deprived? Or should I say, what's the term for it? Uh, economic blighted. The site, he may, the, some people may consider the, the design blighted, but George Lucas is well, well being, he's certainly not a blighted individual economically. What would you say about that, Lee? Well, uh, you, know, I, you know, obviously George Lucas doesn't open his books up to me, so you know, how, how that, um, I guess is $700 million, and how that breaks down exactly what's endowment and what's built through the building, uh, I don't completely know. I mean, I, I think the bridge over um, the lagoon, the harbor there, is part of the, of the design. Um, and, you know, I, I think that uh, what I would hope, at, at least at some point, was that would be that this would help spark transit improvements that have needed to be made there for, you know, 20, 15, 20 years now. Um, and, you know, if you would pay for them, that would be great. As a Chicago taxpayer, I would love that. Uh, but I think that that's probably a measure for, for Springfield. And while we still got a friend in the White House for the next, um, you know, two years or so, uh, you know, there, there could be, this could be the impetus to push for a larger fix um, to fix the entire thing. I mean, there's a metro, I catch the metro electric in. There's a metro station there um, at, uh, at 18th Street, which would be a perfect way to, to, to get there, either from Randolph coming south or from you know, the hinterlands coming, uh, coming, uh, coming north. Um, there's, a, there, there's a bus, there's the, uh, the busway there, which is, you know, you probably, you know, probably is used so frequently, you can probably play in it, you know, without getting run over by anything. I mean, there's a, so there's a way that that could be enacted, whether it's light rail or whether it's, you know, something. But I, I think these transit fixes have to be made anyway, and the museum could be a way to, to, to push for them. And Cassandra, let me just ask you, you, pot, you, you, you presuppose that there'd be public cost. You don't actually know that, correct? Well, recently in the press, the, the messaging has changed. So the concept was that there was going to be no public dollar spent on this, on this facility for operation or um, initial capital expense. Um, since the transportation has been identified as an issue, and I agree with Lee, it has been an issue for quite some time, um, it has been the, the messaging has separated that and has said that's got nothing to do with the Lucas Museum. It was necessary anyway. Again, I agree. All of those, trans the proposed transportation elements that have been brought up so far, um, all include in, uh, increasing and fixing 31st Street. The rubber tired busway is um, this site that 31st Street marshalling yards is just a half mile south of the site and would also be able to engage the rubber tired um, train system. As well as there is a metro station at 27th Street that in the mayor's own plan actually talks about it moving down to 29th Street or 30th. So. Um, Again, there are many other viable sites for this in the city. That is one that is a really obvious one that's fairly easy to show how comparable. It could be an expansion of the museum campus a half mile to the south. Um, would also further benefit a priority development site of the cities that they owe a lot of money on as well. We know that. And this would be a great catalyst, not only for developing that site, but for the Bronzeville community that is greatly in need of economic development. So as far as the transportation elements on the site, they have been explicitly determined that they would be paid for by the public as one of the city improvements. And, you know, just by way of clarification, I mean, having covered government for almost 40 years, that's true of almost everything like this. Uh, 
you know, there is a, there is a governmental piece of almost mm -hmm. anything, and I think taxpayers accept that infrastructure improvements are something that they generally underwrite with bonds over years. So it, that wouldn't be a deal breaker, but you're probably right. Let me, let me ask one that's a little more esoteric, and again, I'm not sure who can answer this because uh, this maybe required somebody with a, a keener knowledge of the actual conceptual plan for the museum, and that is what actually goes on inside of it. You know, the critics have been writing about uh, its design and its location, but I think that there's a really important component, which is uh, what does it do for our educational life and our civic life in the city of Chicago? If you think of the other institutions in the museum campus, they all do a tremendous amount of educating, informing, stimulating, prodding, whether it's watching an eclipse at the planetarium or new species of fish and, uh, and various ways of dealing with uh, sea life in the aquarium or the field, which is a never-ending fount of, of really uh, really provocative and informative and really interesting ways of viewing our natural world. I'm just wondering, does, do any of you have an answer to the question of whether this has the capacity to be of equal civic and educational stature if we can get around all the other hurdles? You're looking at me, right? <laughs> well, I, I would look at you right. mainly because you were on the task force. You sure, probably sure. heard more about this mm -hmm. than the rest of us. You know, I, I can speak a little bit about that and, and, and sort of as a, as a citizen tell you what I think would make this thing go uh, in order for it to be a success and a win for the city, the win that I believe that the mayor wants it to be and the win I think the task force certainly wants it to be, is that if, if it functions, and again, I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't know what staff has been hired or what kind of thing, but if it functions with the same sort of arms and mechanisms as a normal um, quality uh, museum, it being a museum, a museum of narrative art, so it looks at everything from, you know, caveman drawings all the, all the way to digital uh, um, filmmaking and, and whatever happens beyond that, this could be extremely interesting in terms of research and in terms of um, you know better you know how films are made, uh, rescuing old films. You know the film restoration is a, is a huge thing now. You know old old nitrate films are lost by the hour, and uh, to be able to have a place where with the, with the resources to research these things and save them, um, you know it, it could be really good. You know from what I've um, heard third hand and seen, I mean there's classroom space, there's auditorium space. I mean clearly it isn't just a show. Star Wars movies. I mean, there's there's something, there's some kind of mechanism there that's that's learning and teaching and and hopefully archiving and um, and using that and using film and the the narrative arts as a way to kind of do those things. The museum does could be could be really good. Do you think there's anything that compares? I mean, the one thing that comes to mind is the Newseum in Washington D.C., which of course mm -hmm. is this you know this is a tribute to the news business over the decades, which. I have mixed feelings about, you know, it's a little bit shallow in some ways, but it, it does try to give you some background and some texture. Do um, you think it's along those lines, or the, like the Lincoln Museum in Springfield, which is just a wonderfully interactive and, and very modern digital way of telling Lincoln's story and the Civil War story? You know, I, I should learn more. I mean, when I was in Germany 15 years ago when Sony Center opened, and um, there was inside of there, there was a bunch of stuff in there, and but inside there, there was a... Um, so a film museum, I think, it, I think it was devoted to Marlena Dietrich, I can't remember. But in that, you can learn all kinds of things about film. And, and I just, this, actually this makes me think of that, is that um, you know, what, what kind of things it could do, what paths it would take. And I'm assuming they're showing more than Marlena Dietrich films in there. And, uh, and there's some sort of curation and things. And it, 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 it could, you know, who knows, but it, it could be very interesting. And, I, and I, I think part of the public's, as it goes to this public process, I think, I mean, I think we should sort of say and express what we think this should be as, as well, um, if it's going to go on public land, which, which it could. Let me ask if anyone's concerned about something that we found in one of our investigations at the BGA, and that is we looked at the environmental aspect in a very, very particular way. We found that this particular site had at one point been, been a dumping ground of sorts for a lot of, uh, of is it toxic? Is toxic a fair word, Bob? Uh, toxic materials, a lot of materials that um, if dredged up improperly uh, have the potential to cause a little bit of environmental harm. I'm not suggesting these are nuclear rods, but what I am saying is that there's enough toxicity and enough kind of bad stuff underground to raise questions about what happens when you go down 30 or 40 feet for your, <laughs> for your foundation and all that. I mean, is that something that's crossed anybody else's path? Uh, certainly ours, because the, the parking lots that are currently there are 
are, they are acting and performing as engineered barriers protecting the public from exposure to the underground contamination that is in fact there. Um, so that's one thing. As soon as you touch the parking lots, there are additional costs. It's also a situation where the water table is very high. Um, in one document I saw, it's, only, uh, it's very shallow. Um, it's only seven feet two inches deep, which creates very uh, much difficulty, not just in capital and digging, and going down for parking is the most expensive way to build it, um, but you also have ongoing dewatering costs. That is an operational cost, again, that there's an undisclosed amount for operational endowment moving forward. So those are significant issues to be concerned about moving forward. Are they part of the lawsuit? Um, I guess, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but certainly it would be, um, there is a concern about exposure to the public um, of any of these contaminated. I'm not suggesting it. I, I, would, I would bet that along the way someone would file something on those grounds or at least ask, ask environmental group organizations like EPA. I'm to sure it will come up. I'm sure it will come up as either part of our lawsuit or it could very well have someone else. Okay, let's, let's. You know, no, no doubt it's a tough let's site. I mean, you know, uh, you know, I spent two years just north of there uh, on the Soldier Field Project when I was in the mayor's office. And you know, you dig around there. We found cups from the Palmer House, you know, from the from the flyer. You know, we found all kinds of stuff in there. So no doubt, uh, it's a it's a it's a tough site. But um, keep in mind, there's a you know, there's a stadium there that goes pretty deep with some with some measure of underground parking. There's a convention center down the road. I mean, these are things that can be mitigated and fixed um, along the way, which is not to diminish uh, the safety hazard. But there's a range. You know, there's a you know, there's a range of of, of things. I mean. Vacant lots in Chicago are, are you know, some of them uh, under a, 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 the, the first pass of environmental um, uh, investigation are dirty. Then it becomes a matter of how dirty and what's allowable in the dirt. And, and, and if you do this, does it mitigate? I mean, so there's a, it's, there's a bit of a dance there. Again, not to downplay it, but these are things that, can be, that have to be worked with. Did that come up in the site process? Uh, no, it did not. Okay, well... Mm -hmm. And that actually, was, our, actually, that was mm -hmm. our contribution to the uh, public awareness. Right. <laughs> I feel like we did something beneficial mm -hmm. along with this. Mm -hmm. I was just going to mention, it actually did come up as part of the process because some of the other sites were knocked out of contention. Oh, yeah. What am I saying? Because, you're, you're right. Because they were considered to be environmentally. And, and, and one in particular, and I'll be honest oh. about this, was, yep. was Michael Reese, which, which personally, as a, as a member, I, I was concerned about. It was mm -hmm. the, the, the price to get Michael Reese, uh, and, and the, given the, what we owe on it, what the city owes on it, plus the fact that, uh, to my knowledge, I don't know if a was called a, it's not a, a phase two environmental had been done, and it's, a, you know, it's an old hospital site, and I, I had concerns, and I wasn't the only one. So you're right. You're absolutely right. So let's get back to location, and let me, let me offer a cautionary tale that was offered to me by someone with, with very keen knowledge of, this, mm -hmm. of, of, of the Lucas process. Um, and this is the story that was told to me that I want to ask each of you to react to, because I think this is essentially where the rubber meets the road. George Lucas is a San Franciscan through and through. I mean, he loves that city. He lives there. He's contributed mightily to all kinds of civic and philanthropic ventures. And he wanted more than anything for this museum to be in San Francisco. And everything was moving along perfectly. They had a site he liked. They had the design. Uh, he even gave him a couple million dollars in, uh, in earnest money that sat for a couple years while they, that while they danced around the, the suitability of the site. And then at the end of a couple years, San Francisco decided that site wasn't going to work. There had been a lot of public pressure. They decided the site wasn't going to work. And along the way, they asked George if he would consider other sites. And this dyed in the wool, true blue San Franciscan said no. He played along for a while, but at the end of the day, the site was everything to him, at least in San Francisco. He wanted it where he wanted it. When they rejected that site, he said goodbye to them. He said goodbye to his own hometown as the site of the museum. I tell you that because the person who related this to me, who asked him to remain anonymous, and so as a courtesy, I'll do that, that person said to me that your audience ought to understand something very clearly. George Lucas is a warm and generous guy, but he's not negotiating sites here. This isn't about the idea that, well, we'd like to put it here, but we'll put it there. I was told in no uncertain terms by someone who claimed to know clearly what was going to happen that if this site didn't fly, the museum would fly to a different city. And I was also told, no secret, that there are a number of other cities that would love to have it. The, the, the entry offers have increased, in fact. And so 
Um, I think George Lucas, who really has no specific loyalty to Chicago other than the fact that he married someone who works in Chicago, um, he has no specific loyalty. I think that one of the things that seems to be developing is a reality or a, a strong likelihood that if this site is rejected, we're saying goodbye to the museum. Now, that's just one person's viewpoint. It may not be the final word. I tell you that because I want to ask each of you panel members whether or not um, it's worth losing the museum to get rid of the site. And I'll just go right down the row and ask you and just ask you to explain why. Because ultimately, that may be the decision we have to make. Lee? Me again? My goodness. <laughs> well, I'll go if the it's other way. Let me look. Okay. You're absolutely right. Cassandra, you're filing the lawsuit, so I think I know your answer, <laughs> but I'd also like to hear your rationale. Okay, so just to start, as a Chicagoan, um, that sort of ultimatum doesn't sit well with me personally as a citizen. Well, let me just, okay. Uh, um, before you go on, and I, you're absolutely right, and I just want to, it wasn't characterized as a threat, it was characterized as a, a practical reality. Now, maybe it carries the same effect as a threat, mm -hmm. but I just think someone wanted me to, to know that that was the reality here. Now, it is a threat, so I call it a threat by, it's still spelled T-H-R-E-A-T, right? <laughs> but go ahead. Okay, so the next thing I would say is I'm just very sorry to hear that because we have reached out and tried to discuss other sites. I was the first interviewee of the process, the site selection exercise, I'll call it an exercise. Um, I was the first interview and was at the only public meeting that was held and there were, I said first thing, if it's in a park or a lakefront, we will oppose it. Um, no, no, um, no questions asked, non-negotiable. Um, and in the public meeting, this site and the Grant Park site only came up three times. I'm here to tell you there were about 150 comments that came out of it that were all over the city. The only thing I could say as far as frequency, the highest frequency comment, not necessarily the same site, but in a neighborhood. Let's figure out a way to allow this to catalyze a neighborhood and do some good for the city. So I would like to think, and I think Friends of the Parks would like to think, that someone like this who has this amount of resources coming to Chicago, that his wife, it's his wife's hometown, he was married on Promontory Point, I'm sure a number of you remember that. Um, <laughs> this is something that let's use the force to do some good here. Yeah. <laughs> Did you think about that before? No, I, I love the force, I love the force. In Chicago. Let's okay. keep it in Chicago. And listen, uh, that particular narrative could obviously change if a proper uh, argument was made for it to change. I'm just saying that that was the explanation of where things stood at this point. But I, I, think, I think in San Francisco, I think it was a little different. And again, San Francisco, at the, at the end, wanted it back. And the mayor writes his, their mayor writes a letter, you know, sort of open letter to him. But I think it was a little different. I mean, it, you know, he needed a space for the museum, and he also needed a space to store his stuff before, you know, you know, before it got on display. So he was stuck with kind of a two-building solution that kind of forced him into this neoclassical des design, um, a building that was smaller than I think he intended. And um, I, I think the quote that I heard was that they made a box for me to get in. They made a, they made a box for me to get in, and they didn't like the box. So I, I, think, I think it's more than just, you know, I'm taking my ball and going home. I think he was working with the, in the parameters of what they, of what they wanted. And, um, and, um, and, then, and then they didn't like what he came up with. I mean, which I think is maybe a little, little different. But maybe the interesting piece is that his hometown mayor went back to him and said, please consider a couple of other sites, and he said adios. Well, you know, that's kind of how that goes, right? I mean, you know, you, especially if your hometown mayor is, uh, is, your hometown is doing this. And again, you know, I'm not a spokesman for the, for the Lucas mechanism at all, but I think in that case there's a, little, there's a few more steps in there. Okay, and so Gail, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. You were able to actually get a win-win out of the Children's Museum fight because you argued against one location and it did end up somewhere else and so it stayed and it's thriving and prospering and the space, re the space continues to be the space that you know, people thought it should, it should be. Um, are, you concerned, is, are you concerned about the, the, the prospect of losing this project if it would be lost over the location? I would say, I, well, Chicago has so much to offer so you know, limiting it to this one location, I think, is very kind of short-sighted. There's a lot, there's, there's so much more to, our, to the city than this one spot. Um, through the Children's Museum, we, as SOAR, had really supported keeping it at Navy Pier. It was such an asset, we really wanted it to stay there. We talked to Navy Pier, we wanted them to um, work with the Children's Museum to really grow it and give them the space that they needed to really, um, to stay there. 
So that was, um, that was really our angle, was to really make sure that we could do everything that in the way of our influence to make sure that they, they stayed right where they were since it, it's such a great anchor for the, for the peer. So, um, so I kind of agree with Cassandra. If you're just gonna, you know, um, if, you, if, it, if your decision making is so, so kind of blinded by this one location and putting such a large, um, large museum or building there, then it just, you know, that it, there's such a disconnect there. Because if you want the building that's really going to fulfill your, your um, ideas of what you want to have in this museum, then you should find a location that it really works instead of like San Francisco. So obviously that one didn't work. So you'd, f you know, find a great spot that will. You know, and if it's very, if I, I will also agree that knowing what they're going to do there is important. Because if it's more on like a science side, then maybe over down by the science and industry, you know, might be a better kind of match down there, where you're getting people that are going to the same kind of things and they'll want to, to be participating. Well, that's a great comment. So let me ask you from a Friends of the Park standpoint, if this thing had been planned for um, Rainbow, the area around Rainbow Beach or the area just east, south of, east or south of the Museum of Science and Industry, but along the lakefront in that swath of Jackson Park, would you have been on the verge of filing a lawsuit tomorrow on the same grounds? Yes, I believe so. Um, uh, some members of my board are here, but I believe yes. We are non-negotiable relative to lakefront protection and the lakefront. It is a thing that needs to be preserved, and I say thing because it is a philosophical thing that we need to protect here in Chicago. I am pro-development. Um, some of my development colleagues are here in the audience. That's been most of my career. I believe the lakefront should not be built upon. It should not be built upon. That is, and a park is another thing. If it ends with park, it triggers us. It tends to trigger and us. And only so. one more question on that topic. You complained about the lack of new green space. Mm -hmm. If Mr. Lucas got wind of this panel and said, picked up the phone and said, hey, we'll give you 100 yards of, of beautiful green grass in every direction other than the lakeside, uh, will, will that work? Not if, if we will oppose it on the lakefront. The other thing I did hear, though, is that half the Museum of Science and Industry is empty. Meaning it could go there. Well, Sounds like, you know what? Again, another alternative viable solution that could be out there should be looked at maybe a bit longer. How about, what about just continuing the development uh, of Soldier Field into the Lucas Museum since there's no real meaningful football being played there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to avoid that question. <laughs> I mean, you might as well move that team to, uh, to Gately Park, or right? Gately Stadium, for the way they're doing. Can I use that in the future? Well, That's good. My, my friend Dirk Lohan was the architect on Soldier Field, and that is another one of those projects that I'm one of the few fans of. So I'm truly an outlier when it comes to architecture. I'm sorry. <laughs> Free country, freedom of speech, right? Uh, you, you're not alone. I, I'm a fan of Soldier Field. Yeah, I just think Dirk made chicken salad out of you know what. That, mm -hmm. That's all. Okay, so I think that's pretty much my little toolkit of questions. I think really to make this properly in the BGA spirit, let's take as many of yours as possible. Now, Dave Cohn and my colleague at the BGA, Bob Reed, both have microphones so that you can hear the questions. I know some of you would rather scream them out than use the microphone, but... And this ability. young lady had and we, and we just have we just have two ground rules. Please state your name and your question, and Bob and I will not relinquish control of the microphone. <laughs> oh, Bob, you have the first question. Yes, I have the first question. Go here, ahead. your name. Hi, uh, I'm Lila Catelier, and I would just like to say, I, this may be an unpopular view here. I don't believe that your position as the moderator of this panel has been in any way unbiased. I think it's been very clear that you are ag against and mocking this museum. I think I just want to say that. I would also like to say that there is a website that lists very clearly what they anticipate will be in the museum and all of the aspects of it and a collection. So that's another point of just preparation. There, that, that information is widely available. Do you have a question? Okay, well let me just say two quick things. Uh, that's why it would have been nice to have somebody directly related to the project up here on the panel to mm -hmm. talk about that, and we made every effort to find one, so I, I think that I, I, get a, I get a pass on that. I'm sorry if you took offense. All the things I said were in jest, and I will tell you in all honesty that I, I, I am not at all opposed to any aspect of it. I, I think about the lakefront aspect, but I love bold new, new pro I think it's a spectacular idea to have this museum in the city of Chicago. 
I'll let people fight over the, the, the propriety of the location on the lakefront with respect to the ordinance. But believe me, um, I tried to inject a little humor, but it was not intended to denigrate the project in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Okay. Let's, 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 respect everybody let's, involved. let's take a question over here. Sir, you oh. uh, Alan Mellis. I want to speak to Cassandra, please. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my, all my friends on the panel. Um, the Friends of the Park has suggested other locations. And today I heard that maybe the micro recite maybe is too contaminated to consider. Well, too contaminated and, and too removed from other cultural institutions. And, but yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and um, I headed up a community task force when the Nature Museum went in, and the people in the community were very much concerned about how much traffic that would generate. So my question to you, Cassandra, is if George Lucas walked in this room right now, what site would you sell to him, and what attributes for that site would you tell him to make him say, hey, I want to put this in Chicago, I understand the concerns about the lakefront, but you're going to convince him that there's another site that's better? I want to start by saying that I'm fairly agnostic as Friends of the Parks is as to where this goes as long as it's not on the lakefront or in a park. However, um, we are trying to not just complain about a site and, and, and not provide solutions. So, um, I happen to be very familiar with the 31st Street and the Michael Reese Hospital site, um, and it is not too contaminated. I oversaw a lot of the environmental remedi uh, uh, analysis work myself. Uh, there are parts of it that are contaminated, and I could probably tell you exactly where they are, but not too contaminated. Okay, no, that, so, so, that's, so that is such an obvious site that is a half mile to the south the mayor has just announced that he's going to expand and connect the southern institutions, museum institutions, from the Museum of Science and Industry all the way to the Gisabo Museum, miles away, in one campus. So why wouldn't we use this to move south, to get across the Stevenson, to go around McCormick Place and connect the South Loop with Bronzeville. That's a personal opinion. I think it's hard and it's an obvious site to look at that's right there. If it's on the west side of Lakeshore Drive, we will be off your back. As long as it's not in the park. I'm asking you to convince your, I didn't hear anything that gave him reason to pick I, I think the way that I would try to convince him the most, is just personally, is to say, let's do good with this. Um, you, have an, you have a community there and in other places throughout the city that would embrace this institution. This is a, the, the Michael Reese Hospital or Marshalling Airs, again, agnostic, and there's many other sites that just lost the opportunity to potentially host the presidential library. They embraced that, put forth a bid and a plan to try to gain that. The mayor's own plan from 2013 indicates that there are two uses that could be there that would really help spur development there. One is a casino. I know that's fairly controversial. The other one was the Obama presidential library. So you know we can go back and forth about whether or not what's appropriate, but this is an institutional use embraced by the community, has wonderful economic development benefits, could expand the museum campus, and would uh, effectively help a neighborhood, and start paying back that site that we all owe money on as taxpayers. And $300 million against uh, 100 million would go a long way. My name is Barbara Peschler. Uh, I value the lakefront as public land, and it makes as much sense to me to put this large private vanity project on the lakefront as on a runway at O'Hare. That said, uh, could you speak a little bit as to why Mr. Lucas isn't giving his fortune or his museum uh, or his collection to a museum or to a university, uh, particularly one that might be, uh, have an emphasis on film and the kinds of things that he has in his, uh, that he wants to put into this museum? Is, there any, I mean, Is that directed to anyone exactly? Uh, probably Mr. Bay. Yeah. Lee, that's yours. That's mine. Uh, you know, I, again, I, I wouldn't dare, I mean, I, I'm just going to maybe try to, try to get it this way. You know, our job in the task force was not to sort of figure out what he should do with his collection. Our job was really to answer the question that, that if you're going to make a museum out of what you've got, we'd like for it to be here. Um, you know, UCLA, uh, obviously, what, which I think is his alma mater, I mean, I think was also very interested in during that phase when we weren't sure where the thing was going to go. Uh, but he chose to put it here, um, as it stands now, which is fine enough for us. Here, I guess the one we did have a dead battery in that one. And this is Kenneth Newman. I'm on the Jackson Park Advisory Council, mm -hmm. and this is for Lee. 
You work at 55th and Prairie, correct? Yes, I do. And so that neighborhood obviously is on the target of the UFC. Um, as a native of the South Side, mm -hmm. um, all of Garfield Boulevard is, you know, being looked at for future good real estate things. And mm -hmm. obviously your job there is to enhance that neighborhood. And if the Lucas Museum could be used to enhance another neighborhood, either on the south side or the west side, or even at the Michael Reese Hospital property, wouldn't it be doing a better service for the city of Chicago? Well, this is a good question. I mean, um, and again, Washington Park, the park, as I mentioned, the park and the neighborhood were, were, were in the mix. I was excited, uh, you know, just because I work near, near there. Uh, but I think that there were other things to consider. I think that the, you know, I think that wanting to be around other, the, the task force wanting this to be around other cultural institutions was a was was a was a key thing. I mean, we can disagree, but that's that's was that was in the mix, and um, and also the size of it. I mean, this is like 400. I mean, this is a, this is a very big museum. So I mean, if you, you know, take out a map of Chicago and sort of slide rule it out. I mean, and I mean, there there are a few places where it could go where where it wouldn't encroach on something someone's house. I mean, you know, you try to put it in some areas that I unofficially looked at around the city and, you know, it may take out someone's house yeah, or houses. And, it, and that just wasn't a thing that I believe the task force wanted to do. We have a question back here. It's a big museum. I mean, I, mean, that's, I, can't, I can't sort of underscore that enough. If it were smaller, <laughs> there'd be more flexibility. But it's a pretty damn big museum. And it really, you know, takes away a lot of the places. I mean, whether it should go in this spot, we can certainly argue, but other spots in the city, it really would have, in my view, it would have cost something of the people who live in that neighborhood, um, which I wasn't a fan of you know, them losing. You have a question here? Your name? Uh, my name is Lauren Taylor. I'm open-minded about the museum, but full disclosure, I'm a new member of Friends of the Park. Ah. Okay. Um, Welcome. A, Question for Gail and Cassandra. A thing that's concerning is that this sets a precedent for other private interests that want to come on the lakefront. We've already talked about Grant Park. Are there other, you could say, at-risk sites that are coveted by private concerns that we have to be diligent to try to look out for? Uh, you know, it's a very good point because, as I mentioned, there have been several challenges. And so one of our programs we have is speaking up for open space. Again, that is our role to protect and preserve. Um, these types of spaces. You know, one of the questions I've been asked, well, where is Richard Branson's museum going to go if we stick this here? So the concept of the slippery slope, and once we emasculate the lakefront protection ordinance, some of the other protections um, that we have in place that typically are for the public benefit, once we emasculate them, it's going to be much more difficult to stop these things. So one of the concerns we have is shoreline sprawl. Um, we've already started to see it. Um, the Lakefront Protection Ordinance has been in place since 1973. Um, where there's been significant challenges to that. It is a slippery slope. So um, there are a number of other sites that we will continue to uh, preserve and protect. That is really what we do. Um, but this one in particular is uh, a large focus for us because we do believe that it opens up a door uh, to uh, uh, Shaikun, which is, someone else coined that, but Cancun fought very hard not to have it look the way that it does, and they lost that battle. I hope we don't do that here in Chicago. We'll, we'll get another question. You I know, just want to, if uh, I can, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I want to sort of push back a little bit about the idea that this is a private concern. I mean, this will be a non a nonprofit museum. Max Adler gave seven hundred thousand dollars to build the Adler Planetarium, and then when he did it. Um, he said, the Chicago Park District, y'all run it. So it's yours. And, and then and I, th I think there was an endowment. So, I mean, th so the idea of a rich guy saying, here's what I want, and this is what I want to be in it, is not foreign to, to Chicago. And the Adler Planetarium, you know, is, a, is an asset to Chicago. And it's ours. Max Adler built it, but it's ours. And I want to say that about, about the museum, that, yeah, he's going to fund it, he's going to endow it. But the thing, it, when, it's, when, it's, when it becomes a nonprofit, it's ours. Our parkland, our building, there's going to be, you know, if he adheres to, to, to the things other museums do, there are free days. I mean, so this isn't someone building a high rise with a penthouse uh, in this spot. This is a museum. This is ours. And we'll get another question. But before we go to the next question, I just want to make one point. Uh, neither the BGA nor the Union League Club of Chicago have taken any position mm -hmm. on the proposed museum. But since the uh, example of the proposed relocation of the Children's Museum to Grant Park has been raised, there's one significant difference that I just wanted to note for the record, and that is that when that proposal was being discussed, 
uh, we had a very well attended uh, public forum, not, like, not unlike this one here at the club, where the president of the Children's Museum, Jennifer Farrington, came here and debated publicly with Alderman Riley about the merits of that proposed relocation. Um, as a matter of public discourse, it's deeply unfortunate that no one from the city or the park district agreed to join us here today to engage in that public discourse. Um, I think that we would have been much better served if we had had someone involved uh, to articulate that point of view. So let's, let's get another question up right here. Could I just uh, make, could I make one comment on the public-private that I think might be a clarification? May I do that? Okay, because in the, in the Lakefront Protection Ordinance, thank you, um, in the Lakefront Protection Ordinance, there are 14 overreaching points and goals that the Chicago Plan Commission, um, and this will be one of the touch points in the approval process because this is not a done deal. Of these 14 points, one of them actually uses the term public use, and the two uses it uses to reflect what a public use would be are things that not only are very public, a port and a water treatment facility, Public, I mean, these are really public, but also things that by virtue of their function need to be on the lakefront. So I think that's a really important distinction when you're talking about something that the reason it's deemed public, and this is in the, the museum campus uh, agreement, that it's open 52 days a year for free. A very different aspect of public. And this, yes, it will be owned by the park district, but I would love to see them argue with Mr. Lucas about what types of things are in that museum, particularly while he's alive. So I think Okay, Bob. Other questions? Yes. So please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Mike Payne, and I'm mainly concerned with public transportation access, uh, both to the Lucas Museum and the DePaul Arena is about to undergo construction very soon. And both of those venues are going to have thousands of construction workers coming into the area. Uh, as uh, two of you up there mentioned, the Metro Electric Line. Um, I, I am the author of a project that's in the museum campus transportation study called the CTA Gray Line. It would upgrade the Metro Electric to operate as part of CTA's L system. It wouldn't cause any environmental impact because the trains are already electrically operated. Uh, this upgrade would allow transfers to all CTA trains and buses and it would charge CTA fares and operate every 10 to 20 minutes instead of every two hours. I know I can't take a lot of time here, but as I said, it's included in the museum transportation study. If you look up that study and look up CTA gray line, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Thank you very much. So not a question, just you wanted us to know that. Hey, but, okay, this gentleman. Yes, sir. Up. Uh, this question is for Lee. Uh, Your name, please. Oh, I apologize, Michael Hoadley. Uh, there's a site that doesn't exist, but if you look at the 2004 Central Area Plan and indeed the, the renderings of the Metropolis 2020 report, you'll notice that there was, uh, in Burnham's original intended design for the lakefront, a mirror pier to Solidarity Drive in the location of Adler Planetarium. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was any consideration given during the search as to that site? And I, I know you're familiar with it because I know you've studied Burnham's plan more than uh, probably anybody in the room. But what do you think of that sort of concept as Boulder still on the water and very likely not to offend Friends of the Parks because it doesn't actually quite exist yet and it would augment Burnham's original vision? Well, you know, I, I think in that case, I think there was a sense to not want to build an, out into the lake, in order, which you have to do in order to do this, and then who covers the cost of that and is it a public improvement? So, but uh, George Lucas <laughs> would, of course, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, think, I, I, think there was, I think there was not a sense that we wanted to build out we want him to build the thing out into the, into the lake, just, just on that alone, I think. Yeah, let me, ask, let me ask a question having to do with the lake front, and this is just as somebody who sort of observed changes over the years, I want to know if anybody knows if this has an impact on the, the possible the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. You know, Lakeshore was moved, it was kind of relocated, and I'm wondering, would this site be east of the old Lakeshore, or would it be, I, I'm thinking that it would be west of the old Lakeshore, it will be it will be east of former southbound Lakeshore Drive, right. still east. Oh, still east. So that's not an argument that somebody could use to say it's not really violative. Not one that will stand up in court. Okay. Um, <laughs> and can I just you know the the young the young woman who was offended by my tone, which is fine. Would you like to offer some thoughts about the project itself, since you seem to know more about it than than certainly I do? Yeah, because you know. 
I'm, I'm not personally offended by anything that has been said here tonight. I just don't think that as a moderator, you're offering a balanced perspective on this project. I just have, there's a part of me that just wants to be a stand-up comedian. I can't resist certain <laughs> lines. I apologize. Uh, we're, we're totally nonpartisan and unbiased. Okay. No, no, no. I was, I thought you might want to offer some information that would be valuable to the group here and all of us, since you seem to know more about it than, than some of us. If you don't, that's fine. I just want to give you an opportunity. Okay, oh. we've got the three hands raised here. Andy. Okay. Let me start. Right here. Your name, please. Sally Anderson, and I have a question for the lady near me. <laughs> Did you say there was a website of, yeah. that explained what's going into the museum, education-wise, et cetera? Yeah, it's, okay. it's, called the Lucas museum. it's called the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. Lucas Museum, I think, .com or something. If you Google Lucas Museum of Narrative Art, I think Art, it's .org. .org, mm -hmm. thank you. You'll, there's a full list of everything that's planned to go in. But the, the thing about this is that just like any other public institution, Lucas is donating his private collection of artwork to what will eventually become a public, in, or what will become a public institution. There's literally nothing unusual about this process of creating a museum, as you mentioned, Andy. There's, there's nothing, or I'm sorry, maybe Lee said that. There's nothing unusual about this process. What's unusual is the site. I mean, I think it is important to note that this is a, a parking lot, which does not at all contribute to open space as a parking lot. I think that that, just as a site, it doesn't, the fact that it's a parking lot, it doesn't, doesn't contribute. If they were to demolish the parking lot and make that a park, I would understand the argument. But my question, ah. thank you. My, my question for, for the whole panel is, how much work has been done to think about what kind of asset assuming it goes onto this site, but another site, how much of this, the actual economic impact of this museum on the city of Chicago has been considered by, by your positions? I mean, the thing is, is that I, I think that there's an incredible argument that can be made for the museum to be here. I realize that you're not arguing against it being here at all, mm -hmm. but who's doing that research on, on that economic impact for the site specifically? Okay. Um, well, let me just say that that's what the city or the park district probably could have helped us with had they shown, um, because they obviously have to do due diligence as part of the as part of the process of approving it. And and it's unfortunately there not only was an unwillingness to participate in this panel, they've been relatively opaque all along. I think there's been one one hearing so far on the topic. Isn't that correct? There's well, one. It's been a meeting. I don't know if you'd call one it a meeting. hearing. But you know. We, we're happy to do a forum like this, but the city ought to be doing these regularly to get input from a lot of people a lot of places. That's what due diligence is about. Maybe Which, they will, but... But they'll it, have to, right? Because as it goes through approval processes, I mean, right now, I mean, and again, I'm not defending all aspects of this, but right now, these are renderings in a newspaper, right? I mean, at some point, the rubber meets the road, and they have to go through you know, plan commission, park district. I mean, it, and, and there's input, and there's all kinds of... So, so there's ways where this thing can be... Um, dealt with. Uh, we have a question. Can I just, Please, I want to, if I can um, respond too. There is a place where the economic uh, impact of this has been um, uh, looked at, and it's in the Lucas report, and it's mm -hmm. available online. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And my, my response to that would be, if it is good here and creates benefit, which it absolutely arguably will um, probably create economic benefit, it certainly will a half mile to the south or somewhere else. So um, I don't think we're here to argue that, but certainly to allow the economic impact and economic development impact also in a neighborhood would be an added benefit from the city's perspective. But going back to the parking lot, if I can, um, the parking lot is open space. It generates a tremendous amount of revenue for the park district that takes care of the rest of the park. It is open space. It is programmed for different types of uses. Tailgaters, they call me constantly. They are a little bit upset about this. Um, the president lands his helicopter there. They, it is the starting point for road races and cycle races, and the prices are high if you want to rent it. So it is actively used. And I want to go back to this gentleman who um, talked about the gray line. I think if there's so much money here, why don't we get the gray line in place? Why don't we fix 31st Street, and why don't we turn it into green space? We have a question back here. Uh, yeah, hi. My name's Amy Lardner. And as a citizen of the city, I think it's very exciting but I also am really curious, I'm not sure which panelist could answer this question, 
where are the actual merits of the museum being discussed? And I say that only as someone who's observed through history, vanity museums have a checkered history. There's the Frick Museum, but there's also the Huntington Hartford Museum, which only recently finally found a purpose as the Museum of Art and Design. So there is some, some concern that I certainly have about, yes, it's a private collection, yes, it's being given to us, but are we really thinking about what the lasting legacy of such a collection could be, consisting of things like Rockwell Museums and then the very commercial and very successful franchise of Star Wars, which is his, of course, vision. So it's kind of an odd, it's an odd duck as, as far as a museum goes, and I'm curious about that. Well, that could be anybody or nobody. <laughs> well, um, I, I think that's a great question because one of the thoughts is if this, if a lot of the museums are struggling these days. So you look at, you look at those, you're creating another one. With the, the architecture that is being proposed that is fitting this purpose, then what if the Lucas Museum doesn't last for more than 10 years? Then you're creating something on the lakefront with no windows, like we, like Lee said, <laughs> and you know, and it's so specifically purpose to to that one type of you know uh, exhibit, basically. But you know, so I, I think it's a good if, point. If, if I may, I, I, I think that uh, we may have to think a little bit broader about about what the museum could be or is be. I mean, is going to be. I mean, if it's going to be a museum of narrative art that again looks at everything, as the website mentions, from you know, from man's earliest scratchings on a wall to to digital movies and everything in between, um, I mean, there's the potential there. I mean, again, this is where staff comes in, where there's you know, there's curators and people who run it. There's a potential there for it to be a really rich and, and robust thing. I mean, the uh, Norman Rockwell is not necessarily my thing when it comes to art, but he showed the collection. He and Spielberg showed the collection. I guess I don't know five or six years ago. I can't remember in New York, and people were ringing the block, you know, for it. I mean, so. Depending on how it's curated and how it's run and how it's operated, I mean, if it's a first class university, I mean, if, I first class, see where I work, right? <laughs> if it's a first class, um, uh, and, and the money is there to do that, I mean, then, you know, uh, potentially, I mean, it could really be a rich thing for the, for the city, which has a root, you know, America's first Hollywood was, was here. So there's, there's a, you know, so there, there's, a, there's a way that um, it could do some good things. We have two more questions. And not be as specific as it seems. And then we're going to let everybody and then We're going to let them close some comments. All right, Bill Baylor, uh, one quick comment and then a question. First uh, uh, comment would be, I would like to see a rendering in a transparent uh, medium like glass uh, so that people could see the lake. My second point is, given that possibly the old McCormick place on the lake was going to be used as a gambling casino or maybe used as a casino, is there any way you could repurpose parts of that building? Then you could kind of grandfather around the issue of being on the lake because you're already on the lake and there's parking, blah, 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 transportation. I, I got to, okay, all right. I got to confess. I got to make a confession. I got witnesses now that, that me personally, Lee, because I, I, lo I love that building, I love modernism, that's the building I wish it could have gone in. I mean, I wish it could have gone there. There's a theater in there. There's, you know, 500, half million, you know, squ square feet of space. Um, and, and I thought it would be, could be a good fit. But I think that there also was a, was a desire to build an entirely new building. And that building is not without its own problems. I mean, McCormick Place needed $120 million worth of repairs when I was in the mayor's office 10 years ago. So um, it, to, to repair that building could probably eat up most, if not all, the costs. And I think those are the things that kind of made it a little tricky. So I just thought I'd throw that out. Okay. And we have a question here. Your name, please. Celia Leventhal. Um, I've lived in Chicago for 35 years on the south side and on the west side now. Um, what I've seen since I moved here and raised my family is that the public institutions such as the Muse Museum of Science and Industry, the Art Institute, I can go on and on, um, have gone from being accessible to most of the public because they had a free or a free day or a pretty low charge. So a family from, from Inglewood could take the bus and come to the Art Institute. We no longer have that. It costs more to park to go to the Museum of Science, Science and Industry than it used to cost to, I mean, it, it's, if you, I guess what I'm asking is, in 15 years from now, if you're a working class family or a very low income family, how would you possibly be able to bring your kids to this museum, transportation, parking, no parking, admission? Um, it, I, don't see, I don't see how this can be a public institution. Our public institutions are really no longer public anymore. They are, they are geared towards tourists who come here. 
Um, the other thing I wanted, uh, this is a question. Um, your title of this presentation is What's the Force Behind the Lucas Museum? Um, I was wondering what you mean by, f I was wondering how you would answer that question. And, and particularly when I look at this timeline and I see that it looks to me like this has all happened in about six months, which has got to be a world's record. <laughs> That's a lot of comments and a lot of questions and all very provocative and very interesting. Let me first say I think the, the primary force here um, spends most of his days on the fifth floor of City Hall. That would be the, the clear answer to that question and a perfectly practical one. This is, he's going to drive this train as fast as he's able to, uh, you know, within li legal and livable speed limits. <laughs> Secondly, someone made a point that I think is really interesting. What if George Lucas said, it'll be free? It'll be free. I wonder if that would change the thinking about location, the idea of the thing being free. And lastly, before I let everybody have a final word, um, Cassandra, as you were talking about the use currently, I couldn't help but think that tailgating for a, a lame football team and NASCAR races and all kinds of things that choke the environment with pollutants and speed and noise is not really a better use of the lakefront than an educational museum. That's just my two cents worth. I mean, it seems to me that a lot of what goes on on that lakefront is violative when they use a parking lot in those sorts of fashions. But that's just Andy Shaw's personal opinion. We got one more, one more question, Andy. Your name? Uh, my name is Lauren Maltz. I'm with Friends of the Parks. I have a question for Lee Bay. Was the, site some, was the site selection committee aware of the lakefront protection ordinance when you chose this site? And if so, why did you think it would be okay to choose it? We, you know, we certainly were aware, and uh, we think it doesn't violate it. <laughs> oh, you laugh at me when I say that. <laughs> Look, it's, a, it's in a place where there's a stadium, a parking lot, a convention center, a roadway, um, and, and this is, and this, in our view, uh, a museum that would add green space if it's designed the, pro the proper way and be of public use is, a, is an asset as opposed to what's, to what's there now. I mean, and, and, I, and I, think, I, I think for us, for many of us, that's the brass tax of it. I helped build that stadium, I've, and that's 10 years ago. Uh, I've been in that parking lot twice since then. This a museum, I'm liable to go to a few more times. And, and not to make it all about me, but, but, but I think that that's, that's sort of the math, that if there's a risk of violating this thing, the, the, the risk is, is outweighed by mitigated by, 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 by building something there that's of true public benefit and, and use. And as so often is the case, lawyers will have the final word on that and probably Indeed. some judges. Mm -hmm. So did you want to have a few, did you want to make that your last word or you want to add I a will, couple of I will because you stole my last <laughs> word. So I, what was I will, it? What you just said earlier about the, uh, about what things, so I'll, I'll, I'll cede my time to my colleagues here. Well, let me ask you one thing though that could serve as just a final comment. Mm -hmm. How is it gonna play out? In other words, we stand here today and people haven't heard much about it. We saw a couple days of, of renderings in the newspaper and, a, and just a, a flurry of editorials and commentary basically uh, lambasting everything about it. Um, but how does the actual process work? I wasn't aware of the six month timeline. That's awfully fast. Uh, to, you know, to get to renderings. You know, how does it, I mean, do I know exactly if I could predict the future, I would have hit the lottery number. No, but you worked in, a, what I'm saying is just, in terms of permitting and approval process? Well, you know, um, you know, there is, you know, officially the Park District has to approve, the Chicago Planning Commission has to approve, I'm leaving one out. Um, City Council? City Council has to, has to approve. Um, I think I heard the word, the word rubber stamp uh, a, few minutes, a few minutes ago, from some, six seconds ago. You know, I can't comment on that. I mean, there's, there are public hearings and people can come and, and be and, and express their opinions. So, but, but that's sort of the path that it gets there. There may even be does it have to go to the General Assembly, even? For, for it goes to City Council. It goes to City Council. Plan Commission and City Council. Okay, all right. So the transfer of park land doesn't have to go to the General Assembly. You know, I should know this, right? The site is owned I, by the Park District. That's, I, okay. Yeah. But your bottom mm -hmm. line, Lee, is at the end of the day, the good outweighs the, with the potential you know, violation, even if, if not a legal violation, the, the violation in some people's minds of the ordinance and the lakefront's usage. That having an, a, a world-class, at least nation-class museum in that spot um, is a benefit to the city. Okay. And I would just like to thank you, Andy, and the BGA for um, having a, um, having a pro or putting some, adding to the process of mm -hmm. being able to have a public meeting. And I think I would hope that the city, um, the, some of the aldermen that are very impacted by this, that they would get together, they would actually host something for everyone. 
Um, on the, the concept of the parking lot being open space, I know a lot of us who live downtown would probably not necessarily use that, um, that park for, mm -hmm. for all those things, NASCAR and tailgating. Um, but because we'll take the bus route down, most of us do, and don't mm -hmm. take our cars. But there's a lot of people throughout the city of Chicago and the suburbs that all come down here that all should have an opportunity to enjoy the lakefront, and that is how they choose to, to enjoy that open space. So I think we have to be much more open-minded than sometimes us residents or, you know, that we can be. So what this, the lakefront is for everybody, not, not just for some of us who live along the lakefront. <laughs> Okay. And you get the second to last word. Okay. I also just want to thank um, Andy and BGA because this really is one of the very few public forums and certainly only one where this was discussed, where the Lucas Museum and the concept of it not being on the site was discussed. There was the public meeting that was part of the site, exercise, uh, the site selection exercise. Um, there was also a meeting that the Park District hosted on the Northerly Island Framework Plan a few weeks ago, and the Lucas concept was off the table. It was pres presumed to be there. Um, they were not taking any input on that. So I do appreciate this as a forum. I would have preferred if the Park District and the city were here. Um, it wouldn't have been the same event, but it would have been something that I think would have been a much better event for all of you to get your questions answered, which is really one of the most important things. Parking lots. I am not here to defend parking lots. None of us are. Um, but I will say, if we want to talk about ugly parking lots, we can go look at 31st Street. That is an ugly parking lot. But it is open space. If we put a building there, it will forever be precluded as open space. If we want this to be green space, let's go do it. Let's figure out a way to do it. And I will tell you something else. That lot is really important when you look at what Lollapalooza did to Grant Park and prevented the public from accessing it for almost two months because of reparation. Um, there are road races that start and take off from that location and end at that location, and the next day you can park in it for a Bears game. So it is not, I never said NASCAR, um, I don't know, but there are a lot of different types of events you can, you can rent for parties, Cirque du Soleil has been there. Um, there's, there, it is a revenue generating opportunity that is open space that will forever be precluded if we um, mess with it now. Well, okay, let me do one more round of thank yous to the BGA staff that worked tirelessly to put this together. Uh, it was a lot of tugs and pulls to get a panel and to try to get, as we said, the folks who chose not to come. Um, Bob Reed, Alex Gilowitz, Eddie Epstein, Judy Stevens, Alden Lowry, and I think Kate Schauer also helped. But thank you all. Uh, you know, a room full of people who come to listen to a topic like this is what really reinforces the whole concept of what we do. You know, it's really critical. I think we're all going to walk out of here with a lot more information, and we're all going to be better armed for the hearings that may have more actual meaning when they're held by governmental entities. Alan shakes his head. He's lived in Chicago too long. <laughs> I remember... When it comes to planning commission and city council, it's okay. not. Now, you might hold it up, so we can All I can say is Children's Museum. Uh, we've had some examples where things didn't fly that we thought were actually uh, higher than that uh, probe that landed on the comet. So, look, thank you all for coming. This has been one of our best attended and most vibrant idea forums. We do three or four or five of these a year because at the end of the day, it's critical that we be informed. Thanks for coming, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll see you at the next one of these. And Have a nice evening.